Okay, so um, thanks for the introduction. And uh, when I was studying, actually, I so my PhD was in computer science. And if you had told me then that I'd end up in a physical therapy department, I probably would have also been equally surprised. Um, but I, um, I did a so I, during my postdoc, I was at uh, Penn State when uh, Rob Brecht was there at the same time. So um, <laughs> that's how we um, met. And then I did a, a second postdoc in in Australia in um, at Macquarie University in the cognitive science department. So that's where I learned a lot of the modelling techniques and stuff that I'll talk about today. Um, for the last ten years, I've been at at Tel Aviv, um, and feel free to interrupt um, with questions throughout the talk if anything's uh, not clear or you want to ask anything, uh, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, so, so today's talk I'm going to talk of, um, focus mostly on uh, decision making. Um, so throughout the day we're constantly making decisions. These range from um, very fast perceptual decisions like we often look at in, in the lab, is this light red or, or green, or to more complicated decisions like um, what should I have for dinner tonight. Um, so today I'm going to talk mostly about the, um, the first type of the decisions. These are the fast perceptual decisions, things we make in under about one and a half seconds. Um, so a lot of people study this question of, of decision making um, as a tool for understanding um, many different types of cognitive processes. Um, and it's based on the idea that the, all decisions, even those that seem extremely simple, like a, what, what colour is this, um, are actually the result of a process. It's not a binary that we don't know and then suddenly we know. We, there's some process that goes on that explains um, how, how we make these decisions. Um, and so, but if we look at the temporal dynamics, how, the, how these decisions are made as a function of time, um, it can help us understand how the brain processes um, different types of information, how, we, um, how different things affect our decision making process. Um, so today, what the goal I'm going to talk about is what we have, for example, I'll start with a simple diagram here, and we'll build it up as we go along throughout the talk. We have some simple stimulus, so for example, in this one we have to decide are the coronaviruses going left or right, something goes on in the middle, and then I make some uh, response at the end. Um, so the, the kind of the typical way people would study this in the lab for, um, for many years has been you, you get someone to do the task, and then you look at the reaction time and the accuracy for how they respond. <coughs> So we know reaction time is a very popular technique for studying these processes. And we can add, for example, if we have two processes and we think one process is, a, has a f um, is faster than another, we can look at mean uh, reaction times. Um, but of course, we, we don't want to look just at means or even just means and standard deviations because we might miss a lot of the important details that we get by looking at whole distributions of, of movement. So this is kind of a toy example. These are two distributions. For example, we got someone to do a, a task and um, recorded their reaction times. And so these two distributions look quite different, and they probably tell us something different went on in the process of making the decision, but these two actually have, they have the same mean and the same standard deviation. So if we just look at mean and standard deviation, we, have, we can miss a lot from what's actually going on um, in decision-making processes. Um, and one of the popular ways for studying uh, decision-making processes is the, um, the Wiener diffusion model. There's a whole lot of other more advanced versions that, that um, come along um, after that, but this is kind of the simplest version um, that we can use, and it's based on the notion that um, evidence is accumulated in a noisy way, or some sort of random walk, until a bound is reached, at which point a decision is made. So this, this line here in red is the random walk, um, and when the random walk hits, hits the boundary, um, so for example on this task, this is the task you saw before, other um, dots moving left or right, um, so when, when you hit the boundary here, then you answer um, right, or if you reach the other boundary down the bottom, then you answer, um, you answer left. Um, and, and because this is a, a random walk, there's, there's some uh, um, noise in the process. So if I repeat this random walk a um, hundred times or five hundred times, I end up not with a mean of the, of the reaction times, but I end up rather with these distributions of, of reaction times. So in this case, for example, the right was the correct answer and the left is the incorrect answer. But because it's a random walk um, and it's a noisy process, some of the time I'll actually hit the wrong bound. So even though left is the wrong answer, some of the time I'll still um, respond to the to the wrong answer. And, and the reason why these diffusion models and, and, and similar other types of similar accumulation models um, are attractive is because we can then extract from these models uh, um, parameters that can be interpreted in a, in a psychologically meaningful way. So for example, in, in this, these sort of models, we have a, well, what's called the drift rate. And the drift rate is the how fast, on average, we accumulate evidence. So this is a way of quantifying, uh, um, for example, um, perceptual sensitivity. If we have two different tasks or two different populations, we want to differentiate between the two of them. This is one measure, for example, that can tell us this. <coughs> Another measure, for example, we can take from these uh, accumulator models is, is the, the threshold. 
Um, if I change the threshold here, for example, if I move it up, then it means I need to accumulate more evidence before I make a decision. Um, the, good, the good side of that is that I'm more likely to be correct, but the, the bad side is that it takes me longer to make a decision. So this is like a more conservative uh, decision-making strategy, whereas if I want to answer very quickly, I can uh, lower the threshold. Um, then I'll answer more quickly, but I'm more likely to, um, to be incorrect. So the nice thing about these models is we can extract a small number of parameters that tell us something about, um, that are meaningful about the decision-making process. Um, there, there's a few more that we can also um, get from it. So, so now we can replace this kind of black box with uh, um, these fusion processes that tell us um, when, when we're answering uh, right or left, for example, um, in this case. Um, and then, of course, if we really want to understand this properly, you can't, we can't go straight from the stimulus to the decision. There has to be some encoding going on by the, the visual system. And even once we do reach a bound, then we need to, we need to make a decision. So we need to, um, we need to somehow involve, press the button, which is then is gained as a motor process, which involves a whole bunch of other um, things going on there. Um, so usually when people do these models, they just lump these two processes, the encoding and the motor, they lump them together and call it a non-decision time. Um, which, which you need to include in, in these models. <coughs> okay, so one of the limitations of the reaction time um, analysis is that uh, um, there's, there, well, there's a few limitations. One is that we, when we do these studies, we, we look at the end of the process, so we look at the reaction time or the distribution of reaction times, and then we try to infer what were the temporal dynamics that could have led us to this process. So although we see these... Uh, um, Although we see, although we assume that this, this random walk is going on, we don't actually observe the random walk. All we observe is the finishing time and then the distributions of it. And from that, we try and make assumptions about what, what the model must look like to give us um, this distribution. So if we always look at reaction times, then the temporal dynamics have to be inferred. Um, the second thing is if the decision is a multi-stage process, which it often is in a lot of uh, tasks, particularly if you look at uh, conflict tasks like I'll talk about later today, um, it's not possible to segment the reaction times into the contributions from the two processes. Um, and the third is that we might, we might not actually have um, just one type of decision process. We might actually have two different types of decision processes. Um, so we might, for example, have a fast decision process and a slow decision process. Um, and if we see just observe a single reaction time, it's not possible to decide whether it's a slow example of the fast decision process or a fast example of the slow decision process. Um, whereas we, this is something we might be able to um, determine using a, a different technique. So, so if, now I'm going to try and convince you why, why we should use arm movements to study these decision-making processes instead of um, reaction times. And why, why arm movements? Well, arm movements are considered the, the workhorse of the, in the field of motor control. Almost everyone studies uh, um, arm movements. Um, and the reason why people generally look at arm movements is because they're, they're relatively easy to work with. It's easy to use some sort of device to measure the arm, but they still face many of the issues involved in planning and executing movements. So for example, the question of, of redundancy, even if you just look at a simple arm movement, there's many different ways I can do, do the same movement. So we need to deal with these and understand them when we're looking at uh, arm movements. And so m much of our knowledge about planning and executing uh, voluntary movements comes from, comes from arm movement studies. Um, and in particular, arm pointing movements um, are useful because they're, they're very natural. The subjects quickly understand what they need to do. Um, they can be initiated v relatively quickly, um, and, but they still take long enough that you can change your mind during the movement. So we, we don't want to just make a task that's a, a button that's far away, um, but instead we can actually understand something from the path that I take from the beginning to, to the response to tell me something about um, how I make the decision. Okay, so point-to-point -point arm movements have been studied extensively in the, in the motor control literature, um, and these movements are highly stereotypical. So if I move from one point um, to another point, I'll see this, um, this nice uh, bell-shaped um, velocity profile. And we can use this property of trajectories to see when, rather than being a single movement going on from the start to the end, something else is going on which is um, more complicated. Um, in particular, if there are multiple processes going on, then instead of seeing this nice bell-shaped velocity um, profile, we expect to see something that has a, a more complicated velocity profile that we can then try and uh, decompose and understand what's going on there. Okay, so <coughs> this, this takes us to the next step where we now, <coughs> we have this division decision variable um, and then we have subjects making a, um, a particular response. And then, and then the question is, how do you go from this decision variable um, to the continuous response? Because the, the subjects here 
Um, they're not just using the information at the end of the, at once they've finished making the decision, rather they, they could potentially be using the information as they go along. And, and how does this affect our continuous response? So I'll, I'll come back to this um, a little bit later um, in the talk. So I'm going to talk now about a couple of studies that um, we've done in the past using the arm movements to inform uh, decision making. Um, so in this, this first study, um, which was during my postdoc at, at Macquarie University, this is we, we looked at a, a task of the subject. It's a very easy task. You have to decide, is the stimulus a person, um, person or an animal? So something we can all do relatively easily. Um, and they, in this task, they have to reach out. Um, they would see the picture in the middle, and they have to reach out to either an A for an animal or a P for a person, everything uh, counterbalanced um, as you would expect. Um, and this, we used for, this is an example of a uh, mass congruence priming. Um, so what happens here is they see the, um, they see a checkerboard target um, and a blank, and then they're, they're shown a prime for a very short amount of time, in this case uh, 50 milliseconds. Um, and then the reason you use these masks before and afterwards, the masks you can see they're slightly different than the before and the after ones. Um, the masks prevent the image remaining on the retina, so you can't uh, rely on, and if you look very quickly at something and then it stays on your retina for a few seconds, by putting a mask before and after it destroys the image on your retina, and then, um, and then they're showing the target for 300 milliseconds, and they have to respond according to the target. Um, so what's interesting in these, in these masks priming is, because the target's only shown for a very short amount of time, um, and it's masked, when you, if you ask the subjects after the trial what was the picture that, that you saw flash in them um, just before, um, they're not able to tell you better than, better than chance. For almost all the subjects, the, the small number of subjects that are able to, we just throw out of the experiment. So um, all the ones that, that are completed and that are analyzed here um, are ones that, are, uh, um, that, that aren't able to tell you, that aren't consciously able to tell you what they saw um, in this target. So we, we know from the previous studies that if, when the targets are, um, are congruent, when they're both from the same class, if it's a reaction time task, they'll answer faster, and if they're incongruent, they're in different classes, they'll answer slower. Um, and so we want to study this question using, the, um, using arm movements instead. Um, in particular, the question of this study was um, to look at two different types of primes. Um, one type of primes was, uh, was novel primes. So the, these, these novel primes, they never saw them actually as targets. They only ever appeared as a, as a prime. Um, and the other type of primes were repeated primes. And so the repeated primes um, sometimes appeared as targets and sometimes appeared as, as primes. Um, well, why might they make a difference? If we assume that the subjects are building some sort of stimuli response relationship, so every time I see a, um, there's only a limited number of targets, every time I see this particular um, um, polar bear, then I know I have to reach towards the right. And after I've seen it 20 times, I can just have this, this stimulus response mapping for a um, polar bear and towards the right. And, then, and if that was the case, that might affect also the, um, these repeated primes. But it shouldn't be the case then for the novel primes, because you never had a chance to build this stimulus response mapping if, it was a, um, if you never consciously observed them. Um, okay. So, so this, is a, the, this is an example of what the, what the results look like. The one on the, on the left is the congruent um, condition. And you can see in the congruent condition, most of the time they just reach towards the, um, the targets. Every now and then they, they make a correction to the other one. And this is the incongruent condition, um, where you can see a relatively large amount of the time they start hitting towards one target, and then they change their mind in the middle of the movement and start moving toward the other one. So in order to, to get these nice responses, um, we have to force the subjects to start moving early. So in particular, in these ones, we have them start moving before um, 350 milliseconds after stimulus onset. Yeah. I know you want to ignore them, but the mm -hmm. folks who do actually have conscious awareness, do they show the same distribution or a different distribution? Um, we, did, we didn't analyze the, the okay. data for them. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, so we're, ac we're actually trying now to do the we're trying now to do the, actually the other way around. So we're trying to tell people that uh, um, after they've run, they've done a few hundred trials of this, we tell them that you, from your arm movements, I'm actually able to tell what the prime was, and we tell them to concentrate on their arm movements and see if then it helps them in their ability to um, to, to to see the prime. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it does seem to have some small effect on uh, on their, their their ability to see it if they realise that their arm movements are somehow externalising this uh, this decision making process. Um, uh, my, my guess would be that it, they would still show, still show similar ones. The, the reason is because the, um, 
when, when they're when they're starting the starting to make the movement, they have uh, this is only after three hundred fifty milliseconds. It's very very early in the decision making process, so they wouldn't really have enough time to have uh, incorporate all the information in uh, at that point in time. I guess I made an assumption. Do they perform better if they're cognizant, or is their actual accuracy well, closer? Better? Um, I mean, the accuracy here is, is, is almost 100%. Um, right. The only would be in the, the timing. I mean, in, in all these mask priming ones, actually, the best thing to do is, is probably to ignore the prime because you're, you're, um, if you don't, if you look at the prime, then half the time you're heading in the wrong direction. <laughs> and especially when you're making arm movements, I mean, this is uh, um, energetically expensive to do it. So even though people know, and even, in, I mean, the strange thing is even in the case where they, they're not even consciously aware of what they're seeing, they still make these movements um, in the wrong direction, which is not... Uh, um, which, which you shouldn't do on a but given. An, I mean, there are a lot of models of motor control that say we we do things because it's a minimum amount of energy. But this is a, a good counter example of this is not necessarily the case in general. Even like uh, they do it 500 times. I mean, they sit there for an hour, and, and in the last 50 trials, they're still moving in the wrong direction based on the, on seeing the prime. Um, yeah. So you can see you can see this has this effect. The, the 350 milliseconds. It's actually really unnatural to make a decision to start moving your arm before you've finished making a decision. So the only way it actually gets subject to do it is at the beginning we actually just took their arm and demonstrated to them that, it's, that it is physically possible to, to move your arm before you've made a, a decision. Um, and after about 50 times, and they they're strongly motivated to finish the experiments, they can get their money and leave the lab. So they, they um, <laughs> manage to catch on. <coughs> um, so what wh we can one a simple measure that we can extract from this is called the the path offset, which is just the distance from the, the straight line, the optimal straight line from the start to the target. Um, and then we can see the differences. We can see if we, based on this measure, um, if they moved further away from the straight line when it was the, when we're talking about the two different types of uh, primes here. So you can see when, when it's congruent um, for both types of primes is basically the same. This is relatively small. 9% is a relatively small deviation. And you can see for the, when we look at the, um, the two different types of the primes, we can actually see based on how far, how, how, how much they were dragged by the, the other target, we can see that in the case of the repeated primes, remember these are the primes that they also consciously saw as targets, um, and so there's more likely they, they built up a stimulus response um, mapping. Um, they're actually affected more than by the novel primes. So this suggests that, that, there, are, um, the, the diff there are different mechanisms going on here for the novel primes um, and the repeated primes. And the repeated primes, where they may have this mapping, um, you can see here as a function of time as well, um, that they're more likely to uh, head in the wrong direction and for further in the wrong direction. It's a, a stronger effect um, in this case. Yes. Yeah. The, the final picture stayed on the screen while they finished. No, no, no. It also only it, it, it only appears for 300 milli. Okay, so they could be Um, the, yeah, but they were, they were very, um, they're very accurate. It's like 99% accuracy in this one, so. Okay, so um, a second example that we did was with, uh, um, was with hybrid faces. Um, so in a hybrid face, what you do is you, um, you, you apply a spatial filter to the face, um, and then you can get a, a high spatial frequency and low spatial frequency components of the image. So the high spatial frequency is basically um, just the line, just like you can see here. You can you can see basically just the lines, and the low spatial frequency is basically a, is like looks like a blurred version of the the face. Um, the reason why we separate into these two is because there are theories about um, that these two separate components of uh, um, are, are processed differently in the brain by different different uh, visual pathways, um, and specifically the low spatial frequency ones. Um, are probably processed faster than the high spatial frequency ones. Um, kind of the hand waving uh, explanation for why that might be, that why why the low spatial frequency ones are processed faster than the high spatial frequency ones is it's enough from the low spatial frequency faces you can you can identify um, sex whether it's male or female. You can also identify um, basic emotion. You can identify like if someone's angry or someone's happy just but just based on the low sh low spatial frequency. So the thinking behind it is that extra uh, you know couple of milliseconds you get, if someone's running towards you, it's really important to know if they're happy or angry, whether you should run away. Um, and so that extra couple of milliseconds you get might be a good survival advantage. That's why we see the low spatial frequency. The high spatial frequency is more for, th for things like de detecting identity, um, things like that. You need more information, which can um, take longer. So the, what we did in this one is you took a, these are hybrid faces. You, you basically take a low spatial frequency face and a high spatial frequency face and you stick them on top of each other. Um, and they're, they're matched for, their, for the other components of the face. So then you can have a, it's always two different faces. Um, so you can have a female um, 
for example, in this one, it's a female low special and a female high frequency, so they're, they're both female. But you can have these ones here where it's uh, a mix of two. Um, whether you see a male or female is very dependent on how far away you are from the, from the screen here. So this one, for example, the high spatial frequency, which is like the lines, is a, is a female, but the blurry part underneath is a, is a male there. So you can have these, all, the, all four combinations um, of the two. And then we can ask, is, are, the, are the subjects processing the, indeed processing the low spatial frequency component before the high spatial frequency component? Um, so in this one, they were, they were told, for example, point, point towards the male face or point towards the female face. That was a task um, throughout the experiment. Um, we performed a similar as in the, as in the last experiment. Um, and so what we can see here is for the, um, if the target was, was incongruent, um, so, for example, a female low spatial frequency face superimposed on a male high, high, male high frequency um, face, then, then the trajectories were, were more curved. So this is the case when, it was a, uh, um, when there was no, no inc incompatibility. And then the cases when there was incompatibility, so, for example, in the, um, there's kind of two options for how, how it can be incompatible. It can be the target one, the low spatial frequency face is... Um, is the opposite type, and the other thing can be on the other side, there can also be a low spatial frequency phase um, of, the, of the same one, and, and so both of these effects um, make the trials more curved, um, and if both of them occurred um, at the same time, then we get this one where it's an extremely curved going in the, um, in the wrong direction. Um, so the, this, this basically allows us to pull apart, and, and in this case, again, the, the salient face was the was the high spatial frequency face from the distance where they were sitting. So if you, most of them didn't even, they knew that obviously something's going on with the faces. They could see that the faces looked um, strange, but they didn't um, consciously perceive the low spatial frequency faces. They, they answered according to what the high spatial frequency faces um, were in this case. So we could, this allows us to, to see that, that indeed this does seem to be um, a, a process that's made up of two parts. First they process the low spatial frequency face and then they process the high spatial frequency phase according to what we see here. Um, if they process them together or if the high spatial frequency first was first, we should expect them to all have similar trajectories. Did you try varying the luminance as you do this? Um, no, we didn't. What, what, what would you suggest for... Oh, uh, uh, well, so part of the reason <coughs> when, you, when you image hit your retina, there's only so many photons. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, an advantage for low spatial frequencies that cooling over a larger area that collects mm -hmm. more photons. Right. So in theory, you should actually get a luminance effect where the lower spatial frequencies work better in the dimmer light, and they're not just faster in a processing sense, but also faster in a literal physical photon uh -huh. accumulation sense. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I would predict that time and, time and light level would intersect here. Mm -hmm. um, we, did, we did try changing the color, red and green, so that, that also had an effect on the, that magnifies the effect of the low spatial frequency difference. So. Um, um, yeah, it's an interesting uh, question. Yes. I have kind of a similar question about the low and high spatial frequency photos. Um, I'm kind of curious, does the low spatial frequency photo in some sense contain more information in high spatial frequency? Um, it has different information, so it's, it's hard to um, identity of a face. So if you, if you ask specifically between two people to say which one is which, it's much harder to get it from the... Um, from the from the blurred face, so from this face you could, if you know, knew, I mean, if you had to identify who the person was, um, from this one it would be much easier for you to do it than from this one. Two people look kind of similar; it would be very hard for you to tell apart from the um, low spatial frequency, but the high spatial frequency you you, you shouldn't have any problem um, telling apart different people. Um, so be, because of, um, although in this case the decision was relatively, it was a decision where the low, where either, both of them have enough information to answer male or female in this, in this set that we chose. Are these three-dimensional trajectories or planar? Um, so th they're more or less planar. I mean, they start, they start with a finger and then they, they reach up. So there is some vertical component, but it's basically the same in all the conditions because the, the two targets are the same height. So in these analyses, we always just analyze them in, a, in 2D. But, but they are, I mean, they're actually they are 3D movements. Um, we use some different type, different motion capture systems to, to record them. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a little uh, um, detour here, and hopefully um, you'll understand the motivation for it um, in a moment. Um, so this is also coming back to the the motor control, my motor control background. So 
obviously our movements are generated by our muscles and we know that our muscles are controlled by the um, central nervous system. Um, and we know that our, our movements are highly dependent on, on feedback that we get from the movements. Um, and without feedback, it's very difficult to move. So, so this is not necessarily a, um, an obvious statement. Um, and one of the classic cases we know from um, people that lost their ability for, to have uh, feedback, lost their ability for proprioception for all other feedback, um, basically they're, they're not able to move. So the, I think the most famous case is, um, um, is this story here. This is about, um, about Ian Waterman. There's a book uh, um, Jonathan Cole wrote a book about it. Um, and so he, he had some infection in his uh, spinal cord and basically woke up one day in the hospital and he lost all his all sense of sensory feedback, proprioception, everything else from, the, from his body. Um, and he was just basically couldn't, couldn't move because of this. Um, and he eventually learned to control his movements using uh, visual feedback. Um, so he learned again, he had to learn again how to walk and how to do every, all his movements. And, and he's not able to walk and do other movements if he doesn't actually look at what he's, um, that he's doing with his movements. So, I mean, the, the, these um, couple of rare examples teach us that without feedback, we're not able to produce movement, an inherent part of the, um, the process of generating movement. So, Jason, the host didn't make it here. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, he was one of the patients of Oliver Sacks as well. Mm -hmm. So, right. when Oliver Sacks turned 80, uh, he flew. Ah, wow, okay. Major patients and then I broke him. Okay. And I had studied him back in 1997. Okay. So he came and we did a uh, broad study of the CG control mm -hmm. cursor, lens control cursor, and did nothing more. Okay. Uh, so he, he actually was here. Okay, wow, well, that would have been fascinating. In person, yeah, already. okay. He's been uh, doing this for a number of years, and he had damaged his uh, muscles in the back because the way he controls his movement, the vision, is he sends out the Yeah, I know. I know. For me, like before, I thought about it. It seems like if I want to move, I should. I mean, it just comes from the brain. I should control the movement. I shouldn't need yeah. feedback to do this. But I mean, the, these examples are just show you, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's definitely, I think uh, counterintuitive this 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 understanding. But the the problem then is if if we want to if we need to use feedback for our movements. Um, the problem is that we know that feedback is very slow. So even visual feedback, proprioceptive feedback, touch feedback, take, until it gets reaches the central nervous system, to reaches the brain, um, depends on the modality, but something in the order of 100 to 200 milliseconds. So if feedback is so important, but it's very slow, how can we use feedback to control our movements? Um, there's also delays in the response. The limbs take time, even once you, the once the brain has decided to move, um, it takes time for the muscles to develop force, um, and muscles also act like a low-pass filter, so even from the moment you've decided um, to the moment that the limb starts moving has this uh, um, significant uh, delay. So how do we deal with this need for feedback if it, when feedback is, um, is so slow? So one, one uh, possible solution is the use of, of intermittent control. Um, and intermittent control means that rather than continuously controlling movement, rather we um, give motor commands at, at discrete points in time. And this, this simplifies uh, movement planning and makes the system more stable given uh, slow feedback. So if you're uh, an engineer and you're trying to design some system and you had uh, immediate feedback on the position, for example, then you can build something called a feedback controller and use the instant feedback. Um, but in cases where we have um, slow feedback, we don't want to use, if we use the feedback, then the, the feedback will be already out of date by 100, 200 milliseconds. So rather than doing that, it's just that at particular points in time, um, we can, uh, we can plan, plan what the movement will be for the next uh, short period of time based on the feedback we've accumulated and, and our predictions about where the limb should be um, at the ne in, the, in the future based on, our, on the feedback that we received and, and, and the, plan the ongoing planning. Um, so the way, the way this is uh, realised here in, this, um, in our analysis is we can assume that the observed arm movements that we make that you saw before are made up of sub-movements. And so sub-movement is a discrete stereotypical movement that are serially concatenated and importantly they're overlapping in time. Um, so the, these sub-movements, we assume that each of them are straight. This is, a, 
This doesn't necessarily need to be the case. If, assumably, if you learn, um, if you overlearn to do a task, or you, or you have an expert, for example, in dancing or some other thing, they're definitely not making straight movements all the time. They're making much more complicated movements. But we're, told, we're here. We start with very simple point-to-point -point movements, which you know in general, if you make a point-to-point -point movement, it's a, it's approximately a straight line. Um, so we, we still can see curved movements because all the examples, although the examples I've shown you here have been averages, when we look at uh, uh, or in one of the graphs I showed at the beginning, you saw there were lots of curved movements. The way we can get a curved movement is if we have two straight line movements um, and we um, start executing the second movement before I finished um, executing the first movement, and when I add the two of them together um, overlapping, I end up with a, a curved movement. Um, and so the, but the important thing is if we if assume, if we follow this model of movement planning is that, um, that our planning of movements is then discrete rather than continuous. Um, at the planning stage, and it's planned in a feed-forward manner. So every time I start a sub-movement, um, I'm taking in the information I have available, and I'm generating a movement at this particular point in time, rather than continuously um, controlling my movement on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Um, and so this means that when I start making a sub-movement, um, because this is discrete um, on the level of planning, this means that I've the, all the features of the sub-movement, so particularly its amplitude, its direction, its timing, how far I'm going to go, which way I'm going to go, and how, um, how long the movement's going to take, all of this is decided when I start making the movement. Um, and so th we, can, we can take the observed trajectories and then we can decompose them into the sub-movements, and, and instead of analysing the trajectories on a continuous basis, we can instead just analyse them when sub-movements start. If we assume that when you start the sub-movement, you've decided all about how the sub-movement's going to um, continue and end. So for example, this is a movement here where someone started reaching towards the right, um, then changed their mind and um, moved, made a reach and moved towards the left and reached in. This graph here is basically a kind of an overhead view of the, of the trajectory. Um, and here's the velocity profiles in the, um, the x is the left-right direction and the y is the forward-backwards direction. Um, and so you can see here the, the dotted line, sorry, the the black line here is what we actually observe in the experiment. Um, and then the, the dotted blue line here is the reconstruction. In this case, as I said before, each, each uh, sub-movement has a bell-shaped velocity profile. So here's one sub-movement here in red and the second sub-movement here in purple. Um, and you can see here they're overlapping in time. The second sub-movement starts about when the first one is about halfway through. This is a generally, usually is the case that happens with the uh, sub-movements in these tasks. Um, and so then I can reconstruct here, the dotted line is the reconstruction based on the sum of the red one and the purple one. This is the same thing done in the, um, the straight, the forward backwards uh, direction. Um, and then you can see here the reconstructed one here, the dotted line here, it more or less follows it. Um, and now, if I want to say something about the decision making process um, from, from these sub movements, so what I can do is I can, um, I basically end up, for instead of having this whole continuous movement, I actually just have two data points. So with the sub movement, so you have your start to always initiate your movement. Mm -hmm. And so where do you start collecting the sub movement information? Um, so from the moment they start moving, we start collecting the, yeah, the information. Yeah, but you're forcing them to start their movement. Well, they, they move it themselves, but if, yeah, they, you, they, they are forced to move, that's right. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll interpret this first sub-movement, this example for you, and maybe, maybe that will help make it clear. So if, if I'm forced to move very, very early, well, what sort of sub-movement should I make in that case? So I can't move towards a target because I don't know where the target, I don't know which target to choose because it's, it's too early in the decision-making process. I don't know whether it's left or right. So what should I do? So the best thing to do in that case is just to make a small sub-movement, maybe straight ahead, maybe a little bit towards the right if I kind of think it's towards the right or a little bit towards the left. And then I, that, that buys me time and then later on I can make a movement to the target that I selected. Um, and so this is what we see actually here in this example. You can see the first sub-movement starts here around 350 milliseconds. That's because they were forced to move here um, early. And the subject decided to make a movement towards the left, sorry, towards the right. Um, but the amplitude here, you can see, is small. So I moved, they moved a little bit to the right. Um, why only a little bit? Probably because they weren't very confident. Why towards the right? Maybe they had a bit more evidence for right towards left. It could also be there's an initial bias in all these tasks. People always are biased towards the right just because it's easier for biomechanical reasons to move right rather than moving left. So in this case, they moved towards the right at about 350 milliseconds. And then at around 500 milliseconds, they said, ah, now I know what the answer is. The answer is left. And then they made, from here, they made one large movement all the way to the left target. So if I wanted to interpret this, I would say that at 
350 milliseconds, they didn't really know, or maybe slightly towards the right. And then at 500 milliseconds, they knew which, what the target was and they hit it. So I actually just get two data points from each trial. The way we then get around, get around this, because we'd actually, we really like to know what's going on at every time point, but it's, if, if intermittent control is the way that people actually control movements, it's not possible to get that information. So what you do is you repeat this 500 times, and then you have, because of, because of the random noise, then you can fill in the points uh, in between. I'm struggling to understand the decomposition. Mm -hmm. uh, are there, are some is there some constraints in your analysis to limit this to two specific kinds of set limits? Like right. Is there an infinite set of possible com or a large set of possible combinations? Yeah, right. yeah that's yeah, decompose okay. this here? Yeah, so the, the sub movements here, the, the, you can see they, they both have a very similar shape. So this is called, these are called minimum jerk sub movements, and it has, it's a particular fifth order polynomial with particular coefficients. Um, there's actually there's only three there's three free variables in each one or, or the start time the duration and the amplitude so it's so the best fit of that model and and, and, to, and then basically we ask um, how many sub movements do I need to fit here one two three or four we try in these ones that's four is the most we see um, and then you you penalize because you can always do better with more sub movements you could always fit three sub movements better than four sub movements so, sure. so we had some constraints based on the on the on the theory behind it, you can't have two, you shouldn't have two sub movements starting at the same time, for example. Uh -huh. Otherwise, the optimization process will try and do that by itself. Um, and then you also want to you you prefer less sub movements rather than more, assuming the error is below some particular level. Um, but but it's true it's a, it's a it's an optimization approach, and so we, we usually start from many different starting points to, to hopefully converge on the on the true answer, it's not really exactly true. Because I mean, even though this fit is pretty good, it's not 100% it's not good. That's because sub-movement's not really minimum jerk. This is a simplified model of movements. But, of course, of course. but it's, a, yeah, it's, it's an analysis technique for, for doing this. Cool, all right, thanks, Okay. Uh, but yeah, you, you need to decide the shape. If you don't decide the shape of the sub-movements, then, then there's <laughs> yeah, an infinite number of. What about, what about the timing? Yeah. The length of time of the sub-movement, that's the thing that gets you. We don't actually, uh, when we're learning now the duration of a trajectory, it's something that we learn after mm -hmm. the fact. And then you can reproduce that quite accurately. But um, if your subjects are doing this very accurately, it means they already learned the movement. Um, right. So, I mean, in terms of, of how many sub movements or, or duration of the sub? So, the duration of each sub movement, ah. and then they will accumulate to some quantity. Right. Which is the duration of your whole movement. Mm -hmm. But see how that's a very difficult problem to solve for the brain if you were going to... Right, so, yeah, I mean, in this case, there was no strong timing constraints. They had as much time as they needed to, to make the movements. But in terms of the how long a sub-movement could be, we, we based this on, on studies of point-to-point -point arm movement. So we don't expect a sub-movement to be 10 milliseconds. Um, so we had, like, a minimum duration for each sub-movement. Well, I, uh, I understand, but, and I don't, I don't want to call it movements for later, but the minimum just requires to know the initial duration, the time duration, to solve that function. But th this is extracted from the data. I mean, we don't we don't make assumptions about. Uh, but I thought you were saying that you were fitting minimum jerk. Th no, yeah, but e each each minimum jerk sub movement has these four parameters of duration, amplitude, and uh, and onset time. So th those are taken from the data. We don't make assumptions about. Are you taking those uh, durations uh, for your? functional in the in the minimum jerk for your yes. limits of integration, you're taking that duration from the, the, the duration is come I just play I just it's an optimization process. I just say I'd like to, I'd like two sub movements to fit this data. What are the best two sub movements that can, can explain this data the best? And so it plays with the four parameters until it finds the, the best fit ones to the to the data. So I, I do put some constraints. I say the sub movements have to be longer than a certain amount and, and some other things they can't. So it's input to the model. Yeah, the, but, but, but the, it, it pulls about out the times and stuff from the, from the model. Okay, yeah, but I doubt the brain does that, but yeah. Well, we don't, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I mean, we know that the, 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 the sub movements are not really minimum jerk. You could probably, there are probably other sub movements that you do. We, we do it just because it simplifies the, the fit. Um, our, our assumption here is that based on this, that it, that this is based on the notion of the intermittent control that I'm planning here and here, and I that's it, those two yeah. points. I, 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 I get it, I get it, but there is still in my mind is like that question of what is a segment, um, how long is a segment, right? Mm -hmm. When you're learning, this is something that you learn. Right. It's not so. something given. 
Right, so we, we, we do see, for example, differences in the, in the number of sub-movements as a function of learning. So if you learn a task, you might make less sub-movements. The sub-movements become, not in this task, but in other tasks, which either become more overlapped as a function of time um, as you learn how to do it. Um, and in these decision-making ones, what sort of supports our analysis here is that um, if people start moving um, very early, then they'll, they'll make two sub-movements because they, they just don't know which way to go at the beginning. And if they move late, like 500, 600 milliseconds, um, then they'll make usually one sub-movement straight to the target. We suggest that they already know the answer and they're yeah. just going to head straight there. Yeah. So this sort of, the number of sub-movements we see kind of agrees with it and we see it as the tasks get easy, when we do these random dot ones, so you can start with like um, very low coherence and it's really, really hard task and you can make it the coherence really high 90%, so almost all the dots move in the same direction, then it's really easy. And when it's really easy, they make one sub-movement and it's when it's really hard, they make two sub-movements. So it, it seems to somehow have some, to be somehow related to their level of confidence in the decision. Some of it's also just um, a matter of cognitive style, I think. So some people always make, regard, always make two sub-movements. They prefer to just, um, or maybe it's something to do with the, the time press pressure or something else. They always just move and then make a correction. Other people prefer to make less sub-movements. It varies a lot across uh, so the basis function of the training, right? the, the Well, that, that's one thing. Another thing more fundamental is solving these, um, I mean, it goes to the um, details of how the menu of Gerd's model works. And solving it, you have to plug in these timings. And I, I've always, uh, humans uh, travel along a trajectory like that with multiple time profiles. They can do that. And that flexibility bites you a lot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, pre-imposing the timing to a trajectory, yeah. however small it is, mm -hmm. um, makes the problem of finding a trajectory very, um, you know, very large, very difficult. Right, but we, we don't assume anything about so the, the timing. That, that just comes from the data. The, the, the question you alluded to is, how long should the movement take? This yeah. is a question which I don't think anyone has. I mean, so the recent study have talked about the vigor. There's this property that people have called vigor, and this is, this this decides how fast how fast you'll move on based on reward and uh, um, and, and other things. But in this case, we're not taking into we don't we not we don't really care in these ones about why they move, choose to make a particular yeah, speed no, of I movement. Understand. The question is not about this talk. It's just okay. the general. The general question of yeah moving speed and things like that is is a, is a difficult. Uh, question to answer. Okay, so what, what we can do is, ha now we can combine these two approaches together, um, and um, so what we can do is we can take from the decision, we can sample the decision variable at a certain point in time, and when I, and based on the decision variable, that's how I can decide which sub-movement I should make. Um, so, and here at this point in time, you can see that I'm a little bit above the middle, so that's why I'm gonna make a movement towards the right, because I've collected a little bit more evidence towards the right. Um, but I'm still far away from the bound, so I shouldn't make a very big movement because I don't want to move too far because I'm, I'm more likely to move in the wrong direction. Um, so I make a small sub-movement here towards the right um, at this point in time. And then when I here, I'm now hit the bound and I've already decided the answer is left. So at this point in time, I'll just make a second sub-movement taking it all the way to the bound. Um, and then when I combine these together, where I get this curved trajectory that looks like a continuous response, but it's actually just these two sub-movements that have been uh, um, uh, that are running together. Okay, um, so I'll talk now about another, another study that we use this uh, sub-movement approach to analyze it. Um, this is looking at the Simon task. I'm, I'm guessing uh, most of you f are familiar with this. Um, in case anyone's not, so we basically have a, um, a triangle means you should answer left, for example, and a square means you should answer right. Um, and if the triangle appears on the left, um, you'll answer quicker than if the triangle appears on the right. Um, and that's called, the, that's called the Simon effect, um, when it's on the opposite side. And the, the, th the thinking behind it is assuming that you have some sort of automatic response based when something on the left, you feel like you should respond uh, um, left. Um, and then you, and this, uh, um, the, the other process where you actually see the triangle, and you say okay, triangle means left, it takes, uh, is longer, is slower and longer. Um, that's the sort of the, the question we're interested in looking at here in the Simon effect. In this particular study, we looked at two different versions of the Simon effect. So the visual form, like I talked about a minute ago, and the other one is a tactile version. Basically, you have a little uh, um, vibrator uh, on the back of your, on your back, um, one on the left and one on the right, and you have to decide whether it's a bzzz or a bzzz, bzzz, bzzz sound. Well, uh, not a sound, a vibration. They're wearing a headphone, so they couldn't uh, hear the, um, 
couldn't hear the, hear the vibrations, um, and then they had to decide which way um, to go. And in, the, in both of these um, studies, both the visual and the tactile one, they had to reach out towards the, um, which, which, which side they were supposed to reach. Um, so in this case, we used uh, what we call cumulative sub-movement uh, amplitude. Um, this is basically the same as the example that I showed you before. Um, so in this, in this example of the, um, fr from the decomposition I showed you, at the beginning before they made the decision, we don't know anything about the, the decision variable. Um, at some point in time here, they made a sub-movement towards the right. So we know a little bit about the decision um, at that point in time towards the right. And then at a later point in time, they made a sub-movement to the left all the way to the target. Um, and so this basically summarizes the amount of information we have from a single trial. And then we just do this over and over again and we um, add them all together. Um, and then we can get nice, we can get curved ones that are more likely to be related to what's actually going on here. So this is basically just sampling at two points in time. But if we repeat this over and over, we can sample at uh, um, many points in time. Okay, so th this is just a, a summary of the, the results in this experiment. The, um, as expected, we see different trajectories for the cognitive, sorry, for the congruent and incongruent. So the congruent ones, for example, towards the left, this is the congruent one. This is the, the incongruent one is the dashed line, so it's more pulled towards the, um, the other target. And we also, in these, in these reaching studies, we always have uh, asymmetries between uh, left and right because people have this tendency to, to move towards the right, so we need to usually take that into account um, as well. Um, and in the, the, in the incongruent movements, it's not just that they're inhibited. We actually see them sometimes heading in the wrong direction um, in some of the cases. So, for example, in this case, um, when, when the, answer, the correct answer is to, is to move towards the left, you can see that they actually some of the time move towards the right um, and, then, and then correct towards the, um, towards the left later on in the trial. Um, you can also see from already from these graphs that there's a, a difference in the time scale of the um, tactile and the visual cases. Okay, so th this is now, this is this cumulative sub-movement amplitude measure. I, I took the, um, the timing and how far they move from the different directions, and this is just summed together over um, many subjects and um, many repetitions and, and many subjects. So we can, we can still see again here the difference between the, this is the congruent, for example, in the blue, and the dashed line here is the, the incongruent. Um, and, and so we can, from this graph, we can see that the, um, the visual decisions um, start earlier, so you can see that the, the, basically while the dotted line is at zero, that means they haven't made any, we looked at the sub-movements and we saw the sub-movements weren't informative towards left and right. And, and then as they get further on along the time, uh, these are in seconds here, by, by 800 milliseconds they've already decided which direction. Um, but if I look just at 200 milliseconds, I can see that the, at this point in time, the visual information is already enough to start separating it, whereas the tactile information um, um, took longer to process um, in this case. Um, what we can then do with this, what's the nice thing you can do with this technique is, um, I'm just going to skip this, is we can, we can then um, try and pull apart the, the automatic process and the control process. So the automatic process is what, when I move towards the left or the right just based on the location, um, and then the control process is when I move towards left or right based on identifying is it a triangle or a square or based on the type of vibration um, that, that I saw. Um, so and the, way, the way we do it is we, we basically assume, this may not be 100% um, the right way of doing it, but we assume, that the con we assume we have these two processes, the controlled and the automatic. So in the congruent case, basically I add them together. And in the incongruent place, I have the same control process, um, but the automatic process um, is in the opposite direction. And if we, if we assume this is right, then we can actually find, uh, rearrange this to find what should the control process look like and what should the automatic process look like. Um, and so if you look at this graph here, the, the black line here now is the control process. And we can, so so that, that gradually increases as a function of time. Um, and in, in contrast, the, the automatic process, which is this one, starts off, um, reaches some peak, and then it goes down to zero. Because as when we, by the time we reach the end of the trial, we, we're not affected anymore by the side. So if, the, if it was a square and I was supposed to reach towards the right, at the beginning I'm affected by the fact that it was on the left side, I start reaching, but by the time I get to around uh, 500, 600 milliseconds, I'm already not affected by what side it was, and I'm, I'm only affected by the, um, by the rule I was told at the beginning of, of left and right. Um, and this, this then allows us to see what is actually, what are the differences between the visual and the tactile cases. And we can see that there's, there's a timing issue here of the difference, but there's also a, a shape issue here of the, um, of the way that the, 
um, the automatic process goes on here. So the automatic process um, finishes much earlier in the visual case um, as compared to the tactile case. So the tactile one has a, a different time course. The way that these two different types of information are processed are different. Um, are processed differently between the two cases. Um, we're, we're also able to then, so there, there are different models people have suggested in the literature for what happens in the Simon case. This is one model of uh, um, suppression of activation, of activation. So we can then fit, fit these uh, data um, to these cases. So for example, in this case, the, we have some automatic evaluation and at the same time we have an inhibitory process. Um, so the, the inhibitory process is this blue one. And so when I inhibit this process by the blue one, I end up with this trajectory that I get here, and we can, we can actually fit these uh, models based on the, on the data that we get. Um, and th this example, wh what this suggests, for example, in this case, that the main difference between the visual and the tactile versions, it, versions is the inhibition in, in the case of the tactile ones is, um, has a much longer duration than the inhibition in case of the, of the visual ones. Um, so th this is like the, the, the motivation for these uh, for these sort of uh, analyses is that we can, we can really look at the time scale of what's going on um, in, in at the different points of, of time based on this, uh, this sub-movement uh, analysis um, of, of the trajectories. Okay, and we can even look at more fine scale things. Um, after, after we published this paper, someone from uh, um, New Zealand, he, he, uh, we had some interactions and he was saying to me that you, you should have taken into account what happened on the previous trial as well because what, what, if the previous trial was congruent or incongruent it actually affects strongly what happens in the next trial um, and if we divide the trials up by whether the previous trial was incongruent or, um, or congruent we can actually see there's quite a big difference between um, what happened in the previous trial so if the previous trial was congruent so it appeared on the right and you're supposed to answer right then you realize okay it's probably going to be the same thing on the next trial and you're actually more affected by it whereas if it was incongruent on the last trial it appeared on the right and you answer left you say next trial I'm not going to be tricked by that I and mean, you kind of you're able to um, inhibit perhaps the the automatic response so it's actually quite a, you can see there's quite a large difference between trajectories only based on what was happened on the in the previous trial. So the, the previous results I saw you were actually some kind of average of the two, but if we pull them apart, we can actually see nice differences here. So I, I feel slightly vindicated by this slide because before you put it up, I was sitting here thinking about gambler's fallacy and order effects. And what I was going to ask okay. was um, whether that automatic process, uh, your trials are 50-50 left, right, right? Yeah, yeah. If it were 60-40, do you think the automatic process would reflect sort of the Bayesian prior is more likely to go left, so my automatic process should bias left? Um, I, I mean, I think it would happen, yeah. I mean, if it's a perfectly ambiguous, then you don't know what this process would do, but if you gave it even a little bit of a reason to prefer one or the other, you might think it would collapse and become always left or always right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as you can, as you can probably see, okay, not, not in this graph, but uh, um, we, we know there are priors, for example, just left, right because of uh, um, biomechanical reasons probably is, is some some part of the bias, but if you yeah this is a 50/50 case, but I, w I would assume that if you change the the percentages, you you would also see something uh, um, similar here. Um, but I mean even in the 50/50 case, we're back to the same question as in the as I st in the first uh, example that I gave you. Whereas the best strategy would be just to ignore ignore it here. Whereas here you seem to have a memory of at least one trial, maybe two trials as well. That if the last trial you would tricked by the incongruent one, then you, you manage to suppress it, but just, just for one or two trials, and then you're affected by it again. So, yeah. I still, the, it's until, until 3.30, right? That's the, uh, what's the finishing time? 3.20. 3.20, okay. All right. Um, okay, uh, so I can keep going now. So I'm, um, seeing as we're talking about conscious and unconscious, I thought I'd throw this in. It's not strictly along the same lines as the others, but it's a, I think it's a nice study. Um, so the, I don't know if any of you know this story of clever hands. You might have learned about it in one of your uh, one of the courses. So this this is uh, about a hundred years ago, and this was uh, in Germany. Um, this was like the, the smartest horse in the world. Um, his name was Clever Hans, and he, he was so smart that he could answer questions about. Uh, um, well, he could do math. He could he could identify paintings by famous uh, painters, and he would just answer by tapping his foot the right number of times. If it was numbers or it's identified, he could do it. Um, he could do it this way, so you would tap here, for example, what the number is, and do the math. So, I mean, it seems ridiculous. How could a, how could a horse know this? But people were a lot of people really uh, were enthralled by the um, by the particular process. Um, and so, um, does anyone have a guess what what was actually going on with the uh, clever Hans? How he knew? 
Okay, so assumedly someone must have been giving him the giving him the answers to do it because these the horses are not that smart. Um, and so they took the the owner of Clever Hands. They took him away, and lo and behold, he still performed just as well without the, without him being around there. Um, and he they did manage he did manage to convince a large panel of scientists that that he was, that it was a real phenomenon. Um, eventually, I've forgotten the name of the uh, the one who um, eventually worked it out that it, that he was relying on he was focusing on. Uh, um, very small movements of the person who was asking the, the question. So he was picking, even though the people who were asking the question were trying to test the horse and were trying not to give any visual cues, they were making very, very small movements that the horse was able to pick up on to be able to, to answer the questions. So the, the, this is often given an example, of, for example, when you're, when you're running experiments, why it's important to, to use double blinding in experiments, because if the experimenter knows which, which uh, um, intervention you're being given, even if they're trying as hard as possible not to, um, not to affect the experiment, it's impossible not to affect it. So if you, if you don't know, then you can't really affect it yourself. So it's a good example for why you should do it. But th this phenomenon with clever hands is, it might, is probably an example of the idiomotor phenomenon. Um, and this, this is the idea, the idiomotor phenomenon um, is that when, when a thought or a mental image um, is sufficient to generate an action, and this often, often occurs as a, um, unconsciously as, as happened with this, with the clever hands example. Um, so examples you might know, for example, the, uh, the Ouija board, this, uh, popular game, people do it with dowsing where they claim to be able to find uh, water, um, automatic writing which about 100 years ago was also very popular, people just start writing and, and be able to bring information from spirits or from other places um, and a more recent one which unfortunately is still practiced today um, and comes from my homeland of Australia unfortunately is the form of it which is facilitated communication which is often um, um, severely dis disabled uh, um, children, someone holds their hand to help them to, to type um, and, and a lot of the cases people, the children started reporting cases of sexual abuse and other terrible things that were going on which, which later turned out um, mostly to be false. Um, so it's a, a dangerous example of, wh of why you should never, uh, um, even though the, the person who's helping may not have had bad thoughts in mind, it's, it's impossible not to, uh, um, not, not to let these things um, affect what's going on. So the, the particular unconscious movement I want to talk about today is the called Chevrolet's pendulum illusion. Um, and so this was back in the, in the 1800s and using a pendulum was thought to be a, a great way of accessing uh, other information. Um, and this is Chevrolet, who was a French scientist, he performed the f a scientific investigation of this in the 1830s. He was a, um, Chevrolet was a, he was a famous uh, um, chemist and his, his name actually appears on the Eiffel Tower. He's one of the, there's a list of famous scientists they put on the Eiffel Tower. Um, and so he, he found, his, the experiment he did was very elegant. Um, what he found people, what he found when he studied this phenomenon is that if, if you change the support of the arm, then he found that it, it affected the amplitude of the movement. Why should this be the case if it's uh, you know, being controlled by outside sources? And the other thing he observed was that it relied on vision. If, they could, if the people were unable to see the pendulum, then the illusion uh, stopped. So he, he basically was able to show in this very simple and elegant experiments that the, that the source of the movement was the person itself rather than coming from, from some sort of uh, external source. Um, and his assumption was that, this, that, that there were imperceptible muscle activations were responsible for starting the pendulum oscillating um, and, the thinning, and then and these increased as a, as a function of uh, visual feedback. Um, so a few people have, in, have studied this problem, this uh, question in the past. In the, in the 70s there were a few papers um, where they looked at it. They also found, as with Chevrolet, that it's dependent on sight um, and on attention. Um, they, they were using very old uh, technology. Um, basically videotapes, so they weren't able to measure the small movements produced by the arm that produced it. Um, the other main place you'll see it in the scientific literature is for hi in hypnosis researchers. If you're able to make the pendulum start moving, um, then it means you're likely to, more likely to be responsive to the hypnosis. The two usually go together. You can, you can try this at home later. Um, yeah, so I'll just talk very briefly about, uh, about pendulums and wh why, this, uh, why this illusion uh, work so easily is that pendulums have a, a resonant frequency and the resonant frequency is, is mostly dependent on the length of the piece of string. Um, so the, the, this is just a simple equation that relates the, the length of the string, this is gravity, and um, you can calculate the period. The person who's credited with first finding this was uh, um, um, Leonardo da Vinci. This is in, uh, in Pisa. I don't know if you're next to the Tower of Pisa. There's this, there's this church and he was, he was sitting in church um, probably bored, and he was watching the uh, light <laughs> swinging from side to side, and he noticed that the, the, the period, the amount of time it takes for it to do one, 
to go back and forth wasn't dependent on the amplitude. It was always the, it always had the same uh, period. This is more or less uh, more or less true. Um, and what this means with a pendulum is if you make a small oscillation um, with your finger at close to the resonant frequency, you can actually cause very large movements of the pendulum to, to take place. So you, if, you, if you know what the frequency of the pendulum, what its uh, resonant frequency is, which is based on this equation here, you actually, and, if, and you move this resonant frequency, then the pendulum can start moving a lot, even though your movements will be very, very small. Whereas if you move it at another frequency, it, it won't, it won't um, cause much movement of the pendulum. So in this study, we, we measured, we studied the mechanisms using uh, accurate motion capture equipment. The, qu the specific questions were what part of the body do people move and, and is it the illusion dependent on the, the pendulum length? Um, so this is, a, this is the sort of setup with some of these uh, motion capture sensors. Um, we had on the, we used at the pendulum, we used one of the sensors and we stuck a few on the, on the arm. Um, and we had a bunch of conditions with different sized pendulums and whether we told them to move um, or, or not to move. And this is an example of two subjects. This subject on the left is one that succeeded, and this is a, an, an example of a subject that didn't succeed. Um, so the movement here in red is the thumb movement, um, and the movement in, and the picture in blue is the pendulum movements. So you can see that even when you, here you move the thumb very small amounts, that pendulum moves much, much more than the amount of the pendulum. So, and you can see that in these two cases, this is the person who did move, succeed, and this is the case of the subject who didn't succeed. So the, pen, the amount of the thumb, there's always some movement, um, tremor, other small movements that people are always making. Um, and so the way to quantify this is we, look, we did a Fourier transform to look at which frequencies um, are there in the movement. And so you can see in this case, the, so the red is the thumb and the blue is the pendulum. So you can see in the case of the case where they did succeed, you can see there's a peak, it's admittedly a very small peak, but it's a peak at exactly the right frequency, one around one hertz, which is the natural frequency of this pendulum. Um, whereas in this case, you can see there's a very small peak in the pendulum just when they happen to move at the right, but you can see there's no clear peak observed in the finger movement. So their movements were much more uh, generally random in this case. <coughs> um, so what we did see is we, we defined had some measure of success, um, and we saw that the, 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 whether people succeed is dependent on the length of the... Um, of the pendulum. If the pendulum is 40 centimetres, they're relatively successful. If the pendulum is much shorter, um, then only the very, most people are not able to do it. And where if it's longer, um, also less again can do it. Um, wh why might be this the case that it's dependent on the, on the length? So when you, when you change the length, you change the resonant frequency. Um, and our body parts actually have resonant frequencies as well. So your, your body part, you can think of your arm basically as also like a pendulum. The only thing is with your arm you can change the resonant frequency a little bit. If you contract, contract your muscles for example, you can make your arm stiffer so you can change it somewhat. But there is still, there are other studies for example showing if you ask someone to move their arm back and forth at the preferred pace, they will generally select a frequency that's close to the, to the natural frequency of the limb. So assumingly in this case, if, if the if the pendulum's natural frequency is close to the natural frequency of your movements, then that might explain why you're more likely to be able to succeed at some uh, lengths and not at other lengths. Um, so the other thing we found is just in general that people who move their hand more are more likely to succeed at doing the task. Maybe if you just move your hand more, somehow you, you find the natural frequency and do it. Um, it's still kind of an open question that we um, have here is whether people actually know do people know that a pendulum has a natural frequency of one hertz and they start moving their hand at one hertz to do it? Um, so is it reliant on some implicit knowledge of physics in the world? We've thought about doing some sort of VR studies to try and, um, if you play with the physics, are people still able to learn immediately the physics or is it based on your pre-existing knowledge? I don't, don't have a good answer for this uh, um, yet. In terms of which part of the body contributed, um, it was actually varied quite a lot between uh, um, different subjects, although most of it, most of the movement actually came from the um, from the body, not from the arm, so 40% actually came from movements of the, of the whole body, so assuming people making smaller back and small forward movements, and these movements you can, were, were very, very small, so that's why the subjects were not, were not consciously aware that they were um, making these movements as they were doing it. I think I maybe forgot to say this at the beginning, we told them hold the pendulum, make the pendulum move left and right, but don't move your hand, and so almost about two-thirds of the subjects that, that did it were able to succeed in this seemingly um, ridiculous uh, request from, from us to do it. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the, the, the participants that were successful um, was, was, was likely because at, at the 40 centimetre one, the, um, the natural frequency is about one hertz, 
um, or 80 centimeters, it's 0.8 hertz, whereas when it's a shorter one, the, the frequency is much higher, which maybe it was further away from the natural frequency or, or more difficult to do um, in this case. Um, so ju just, to, just to conclude is uh, in the first part of the talk, um, hopefully I convince you that using arm movements rather than just uh, reaction times to record responses can give um, significantly more details about the cognitive processing and how it um, varies as a function of time. Um, in particular, they're good for example situations with multiple processes like I showed you with the, the mass priming and with the, with the Simon effect and with the faces with the, t the low spatial frequency and the high spatial frequency. Um, and so we've shown that the arm movements can be exploited to re reveal the state of decision making um, at times before the final decision on a trial to trial basis, although the um, we have to remember that if, if, we, if this intermittent control is really the way movements are controlled, in general we're only able to access one or two points of, or three points of data in, in any particular repetition, so we need to perform it a lot of times to be able to say something about the whole uh, temporal dynamics. Um, and in particular we can use it for tracking processing of non-consciously observed stimuli. Um, okay, and I think that was the final model. Um, and so all, all of our movements um, involve decision making in general when I want to when I want to start moving how far I want to move how fast I want to move so in general the processes of decision making and movement are always um, combined together the, the very old models of first I decide and then I move don't um, don't really aren't really supported by the data that we see rather the two things are occurring simultaneously and we're always making decisions based on many things about how, to, how we select the particular parameters of our movement um, so to fully understand and model motor control you need to take into account um, the decision-making process that leads up to it. Um, and likewise, using arm movements can inform us or something about decision-making. So just to finish up, these are different people that helped out and worked on the studies I talked about today. Thank you. <laughs> Um, they, they didn't. Ha sometimes they did. I mean, off, most of the time they, they had this bias to move towards the right. So often they would move towards the right, and then they would uh, cross their midline. And that, they were seated usually, so the the, um, the middle of the screen they had to reach toward. They were, the two targets were here, so they were sitting right in the middle. Um, so if the decision, the correct decision was to move across the midline. Um, so it will t in, in general, it will take longer in those cases for them to, to reach the target if, if they had to go further. But I, I mean, in these cases, again, the, the, the optimal strategy in terms of energetics would be just to move forward straight ahead and not, not be affected by the decision variable early and then move, move at some point later on. But no, almost nobody seems to do this. Um, so I, I mean, I think this is just a general property of the, of the motor system that we try to take advantage of, uh, um, of the available information um, at that particular point in time so that we can try and sort of buy us on a statistical sort of uh, level that uh, if on average, you know, I'm, I'm expecting, you know, that when I think I'm now 70% likely that I'm going to want to move towards the right, I should start moving towards the right, not all the way to the right, so that it'll be, I can be quicker and respond more efficiently later on. I think that's why, I mean, th these examples, obviously, in real life, we probably don't meet a lot of these particular examples where someone's purposely uh, providing us with wrong information about how we should move. Um, but, but we can see, I think it's, it's an example of how we, we try and utilise as much information as we have available at that point in time while planning the movement, but also taking into account the uncertainty because what you don't see is you don't see subjects deciding they want to move to one target and then correcting it. From the sub-movement analysis, we, we would be able to see if that was the case. If they planned to the right one and then they decided to the left, it does happen occasionally, um, but in most of the cases they do, they do plan small movements first um, to basically to buy themselves time to make another movement later on. So they do seem to be taking, it, un, taking into account the, the, the uncertainty at, at that particular point in time. Um, so the problem with eye movements is that usually you know you saccade straight no, to, right, to right, one point. Right, you, you got lines and your job mm -hmm. is to make your eye slowly track along lines mm -hmm. to the left or right. Yeah, um, 
<laughs> that's a good question. I mean, of how you do tracking. So actually, a lot of the motivation from the people who started doing these studies using arm movements rather than um, was based on eye movement studies, where they'd often just look at the percentage of the time when someone moved towards the right or the left or cicada. But there, but because cicadas are uh, generally one direction or the other, and you because you're never going to make a cicada halfway towards the target because that would just be silly. Um, so um, if someone had to track a line, um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm not going to have a, a good answer for that. So using this um, technique, would you expect to see the same thing like you look at people play competitive video games or like move your mouse to control where the crosshairs are going or whatever? Um, I, it seems like a similar case where people have to make decisions very, very quickly and they might make small movements before they have all the information they need. So I don't know if you would expect to see the same thing if you look at like that kind of data. Um, so yeah, I mean, assuming if you have some partial information, or it could be based on previous examples, or you have something that's suggesting the movement's going to be towards the right, so you, yeah, you would, you would likely make a movement, but you don't want to make too big a movement because then you have to correct um, that movement with a larger corrective sub-movement afterwards. So I, I would guess that in, in those sort of more complex examples, people would take into account the, the likelihood of the different uh, options and, and the current, current state of uh, evidence accumulation that they have. Um, but yeah, in the lab we usually pick the <laughs> simpler experiments because something complicated like computer games with that it would be, be uh, yeah, much harder to pull apart. So uh, Michael Spike, you're running Fogus' whole continuity of Mindbook, right? And it was all mm -hmm. big deal about mouse tracking and how it was built this continuous decision making process, right? You and I are both on the same thing, which is I think to show that based on just intermittent discrete decisions being added to each other, you can get these strong trajectories. So I've gotten that as far as I can say that it doesn't have to be continuous, but unfortunately I haven't been smart enough to figure out if there's a way to say if it is in fact discrete or are both models plausible. Do you see a way that we can actually distinguish between these two? Um, okay, yeah, well, I've also thought about a lot about this question. Um, someone gave me an idea actually recently about this, which said maybe the, the, there's a notion of uh, um, general compression, so basically how, when you want to represent a trajectory, um, do you, is it enough to just see, if you see the first part of the trajectory, are you able to predict what's going to happen afterwards? And one way you could formalize that would be by using compression. So if you're able to compress the, the representation of the trajectory, then that suggests that it's, not, it's only being controlled at certain points in time, whereas if you, were, um, if you are really controlling on a continuous basis, then you shouldn't be able to do a good prediction on what you've seen uh, just before. So. There seems to be something in this sort of way where you could maybe prove that people are using intermittent control rather than uh, continuous control, but I haven't seen anyone do it yet, so it's a... Uh, <laughs> um. I mean, from the motor control register, it also seems to be the case that you alluded to this too, that typically it's not more than four-ish sub-movement. Right. right. Each sub-movement is quite applicable. So, I mean, with the continuous case, wouldn't that argue that it, it should fully, uh, there should, in principle, be no limit to the number of sub-movements that could be... Uh, th this is just, th there's only four sub movements because the movements are, are over in 800 milliseconds. Right. So if you were, we're looking at some other, I'm looking at some study now with the, where the, the movements take a minute and there we expect to find, uh, you know, a hundred or more, okay. hundreds of sub movements. So it's, it's just because it was, they're quick movements. Um, right. and it's computationally, it's difficult to do the decomposition. So when we stick to short movements, it's easier, but it's, uh, it's unlikely to be the case in, in long run. Have you looked at what happens in the underlying uh, join angle space or, or loss of symmetry? In terms of the... Uh, uh, in terms of the sub movement without the PMF vector. And also, um, so you had the sub movements. Have you looked at their sub speed profiles and like their accumulation? Can you predict something from sub movement at time t to sub movement at t plus one and so on? Prediction. prediction of the, the uh, probability distribution that characterizes each movement. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If you do it at all times, you accumulate some frequency histogram and you could hop from one to another and mm -hmm. predict. Um, but the underlying joint angle space is many to one, so that's why I asked mm -hmm. you. Looked at that because that's a complicated space to model. 
Yeah, no, we, we, we've only been looking at just the endpoint space. Endpoint. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of people of studies that have looked at uh, yeah. of whether you control movements in endpoint space or whether you control them in joint space. And I don't, I don't know if there's a good uh, well, no, conclusion. Well, <laughs> it's task dependent. It's task dependent. depends on left or right arm as well. There's differences yeah. in the arm um, and, and a bunch of other things. So we, we are... We, we avoided looking at it just for, <laughs> uh, for our sanity. But just for but the, since mm. there are delays, and there's the notion that to compensate for delays, you use um, prediction. Right, and, and assumably movements depended on you know, whether you're making the movement to the right, where it's elbow mainly, or whether it's the left, where the shoulder is involved, so this will also affect it. Um, and in terms of the statistics of sub-movements, so I mean, there, there are, people have particular parameters that they select their sub-movement parameters from, but some of the things, for example, like where, where I showed you always the, the second sub-movement, for example, when you make two sub-movements, it doesn't occur at a random time. It, it always almost occurs when people are halfway through making the, the first sub-movement. So there seems to be some sort of strategy going on there for why, when you should make the next sub-movement. Um, I still don't have a good reason for why, like the amplitude of sub-movement and, and duration of sub-movements. This is not, not really well explained by the models at the moment. 